Welcome to The Everglow, a podcast with real advice you can actually use to live a better, happier life, especially if you're an empath. No burning sage, no crystals, no BS. Join me as I travel the world sharing the valuable lessons I learn. Hit subscribe on iTunes or wherever it is that you're listening to this to get new episode updates. Mr. International coming at you from the island of Shargao. What? I know we were in Shargao last week and we left, but now we're back. <laughs> yep, it's been a weird week, but I've actually done something I never had d- never usually do. I've come back to the same place twice. And to make matters worse, I've come back to the same place twice within just a few days. So I flew back to Shargao and I did it all because of... My buddy known as Thailandy. So in a strange move, and I think it was fueled by, you know, three consecutive nights of staying up and partying till like five or six in the morning in Bangkok, which I don't even know. I, I think I understand now what happens with people that love Las Vegas. They lose track of time. Like that never happened to me. I, I really don't like Las Vegas, but it totally happened to us in Bangkok where I don't, I don't know how, like, I don't know where the time would go. Like we would just go out in the evening and next thing you know, it's like two, then it's three and then it's four and it's five. And you're like, and this is considering time usually goes slower on your trips. Right. So I guess after three or four nights of this, um, you know, cause it's not like you go to bed at 6am and then you wake up at like 12 PM. I would still wake up at you know, seven or 8 a.m. So I'd have almost no sleep. So, so burnt out, I think I decided I just wanted to go home earlier. Uh, I think this is also partly because I've been, it's been such a hectic travel schedule this last season or this, you know, this last quarter. So anyways, all that aside, I did something I've never done before. I decided to book a ticket to come home several days earlier or several days early, and um, unfortunately, as time went on, the days progressed, I started having a change of heart for that, uh, in part, in, in large part, because, see, me and my friend Thailandy were going to split up, so he was going to stay in Thailand to go to a, a lantern festival, which he's going to discuss in a minute, and I was going to go to uh, the Philippines to check out this amazing island that you may have never heard of called Shargao, but you've probably heard of something called Cloud Nine. And Cloud Nine is a world-famous surfing point that is here in, off of the island of Shargao. So I wanted to come here. So I came over here. Meanwhile, he went to northern Thailand. And then we were going to cross paths again as he was going to fly to the Philippines, and we were going to go to this other island called Bantayan. So, you know, things didn't totally work out as planned. They did and they didn't. But he decided instead of going to Bantayan to go to Shargao. And I thought, at that point, I had already flown back to Cebu to get ready to go to Bantayan. But I thought, you know what? Instead of going home early, when am I going to be here in this tropical paradise, you know, with a good friend of mine? Um, Because I've often come by myself just for some escapism and to just, you know, clear my head. So this would have been my first time, like, with a good friend of mine in in this kind of environment. So if I would have gone home early, I would have missed this, you know, experience, too. Because Shargao's got a pretty robust nightlife, and it's it's easy to meet people. And when I was here the first time, I didn't really, like, go out in the night because I was by myself, and I just didn't really feel like it. I'd get lazy, and I'd start watching, you know, movies from the the 90s and 2000s on, on HBO for some weird reason. Uh, so anyways, I, I, after much contemplation and talking with, you know, my dad back home, even he said, look, you spent all this money to get there and it's taking you a lot of time to get there and a lot of organization, you know, when are you going to be back? Much less with like a good friend of yours. Why not come back? 
or no, why not stick around a few more days and, you know, enjoy, enjoy yourself. Cause that's always my dad's motto, which is, you know, like just enjoy yourself. So now I had two return tickets to LA and, you know, thankfully I called the airline and it wasn't all for nothing. So luckily the airline, which kind of surprised me, I thought it was just, it was all my money was gonzo, but luckily they were able to cancel my ticket and just charge me a, a cancellation penalty. So I got some of my money, my money back, which is a plus. And uh, yeah, this morning I flew to Siargao to meet Ty Landy. Uh, I'd, I'd seen him yesterday, actually. He'd flown into Cebu briefly, and then he flew out again. Because you, you always have to transit in Cebu to get to Shargao for some reason. So I was feeling like shit yesterday. <clears throat> I'm not really sure what I was fighting. Um, I, I, it's not a cold. It's not a flu. But I just wasn't feeling like... I knew something wasn't right with me. I kind of had a mild headache, and I never get headaches. So I was really like just trying to rest yesterday and what have you. So to make everything even better, of course, my flight was at 6 a.m., which means I had to wake up at like 3.30 in the morning, if you even call it waking up when it's that time. Now, on the way out of the hotel in Cebu, these two guys were walking into the hotel, two guests of the hotel. I couldn't tell if they were American or whatever, but uh, in tow, they had these, what looked like two stunning, you know, girls in tow to come back into the hotel. So while I was waking up and leaving to go to the airport, these two guys were probably coming back from a night of partying with these two girls. But they were almost overly made up. And uh, it, interestingly enough, the security guy at the hotel wouldn't let them in uh, for whatever reason. So they had to wait outside the hotel while these two guys went back into the hotel. Uh, I'm pretty tight with the security at this particular hotel because I, I've stayed there so many times. They kind of all know me, which is why I will stay there at it's such a gimmick, but it's so, it's so much fun being there because they, they're really nice to me. But the, the security guy was telling me, you know, you see those two guys there, uh, those, two, those two people there, they're actually lady boys. Um, so it kind of, it surprised me because on one hand I thought, oh my God, these guys went and picked up these two hotties from a nightclub or whatever. But then part of me was thinking after the security guard to- told me that, I'm like, man, do these guys even realize it? <laughs> like, do these do these guys even realize that they have a couple of lady boys in tow? Because <clears throat> it's hard to tell. So, um, anyways, I got to the airport. I wasn't. I still wasn't feeling great. You know, I was kind of an, really groggy, and I was getting cranky. Uh, Philippine Airlines had some stupid rule. Like all the other lines, uh, the other airlines have a twenty kilogram rule on your your check in suitcase. So your suitcase can be up to twenty kilos heavy. And these idiots have ten, a whopping 10 kilograms. Like, whose check-in suitcase is 10 kilograms? So, anyways, I had to pay extra for that, and it was just annoying, and I was, whatever. So, I finally get here to Sargao, and, you know, not much has changed in the last three days since I was there, except now it's raining a lot. But, uh, thankfully, I'm here with Thailandy. Unlike other travelers, this guy's cool, a cool cat. He's cool with the rain. To be honest, I'm cool with the rain, too, because we live in L.A. where it barely rains. Um, so we're making do what we can on our first night. We got our motorbike squared away. We're staying at this um, kind of a newer hotel. I guess it's owned by some German dude. There are a lot of Europeans in Chargau for some reason. I'm not sure why it's more European-based than American, but it is that. And, uh, yeah, we're just chilling in the hotel. We went out to get some sushi a drunken sushi and uh went to get some matcha which him and i are into right now so yeah we've just been we're debating what to make today's podcast about and we were kind of discussing random subjects so without further ado we got ty landy who's nodding off to sleep but why don't i let ty landy introduce himself and how he fell in love with thailand and why he is here now Okay. Hey guys, I'm Ty Landy. Um, I believe it was l- last year, right? Um, November 2022 was my first time in Thailand, and um, man, it was a uh, it was a life changing experience. You know, I've been to Asia in the past: Japan, Taiwan, um, China, Vietnam. 
but nothing prepared me for what I was going to experience in Thailand, which I felt like um, had all of the best things of all the Asian countries combined, with a um, with a um, a mixture of cultures that I hadn't seen elsewhere. You see, uh, Thailand is geographically located in between India and the rest of Asia. Um, also bordering Laos, Cambodia. Um, so, culinarily, they have this culture where it's, well, not only culinary, but also religiously, right? They have the Indian influence of um, Buddhism and the culinary influence from India as well with curry and a lot of this more exotic spices. Um, also, uh, they have... Um, the city of Bangkok itself is super modern and... Uh, um, which I didn't expect. Uh, from the little on you from about Bangkok. Well, so what what prompted you though? I know last year you had to go to Asia for some business, but of all the countries yeah. you could have gone to visit, what prompted you specifically to go to Bangkok? Um, well, I was in uh, Vietnam, and I had three. I, I had like maybe four days, and my friend was going to Malaysia, and I was trying to figure out where I was going to go. You know, Th Thailand's one of those places that I've heard of people going, but I've never gone myself, so... I just want to go check it out to see what it's like, you know? I was pleasantly surprised. So when you went last year to Bangkok, like, how... How long were you there before you kind of... had this light bulb go off in your head where you're like, okay, I've been missing out and I need to come back here? Um, I don't know if it was ever a light bulb. I would say it was like, th there's no single light bulb moment. I think this throughout the whole trip, um, I t I did a lot of like tours around the country. Uh, saw a lot of temples, did a lot, did biking tours, did food tours or cooking classes. And, um, yeah, every single one of those experiences was so unique. Um, it just made me feel like there was so much more potential uh, in the country, you know, to to see. And, well, and, and you know, when I got back, you know, my, I, I changed, right? It, it kind of changed my life in a, in a small way, right? Do you re recall? Well, I remember, yeah, I, I felt like you had... Uh you now had like a renewed passion for things and you had like something to look forward to, which would be like potentially another trip back. I uh -huh. know, I remember you got really involved with uh, the Thai culture and making your own food, like cooking. You started learning how to cook Thai food, mm -hmm. even complex dishes and whatnot. Um, right. That was part of it, yeah. Then you even started cooking. going to Thai, like Thai restaurants and doing karaoke. Is it karaoke? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, there's a karaoke place. I feel like you turned into a Thai. I, I think I've always... Um, I, I think the, d the deeper thing about all this um, is that in, in the past when I traveled a lot, I always try to assimilate to the culture. You know? Yeah. Yeah, what, what I mean is like I get really into wherever I am, I, and I naturally like to try to become a local, which is my nature. I, I, when I go somewhere, I kind of just try to fit in, you know. And I, I tend not to judge too much on whether how we do in my, you know, how we do in our country or how I'm used to. You know, you kind of just, I, I, well, at least I kind of just try to assimilate. So that's kind of my natural thing to do, I guess. Now, you, from what I recall, you know, we were considering doing the, today's podcast a little bit on 
so whether to do solo travel versus group travel. Mm-hmm. So Thailandy, when you went to Thailand last year, you were were you solo? Or were you with a group? What was your scenario? I was um, well. I was staying in hotels by myself. Um, I was by myself, so I guess I was solo. But I never really felt alone. Um, I was doing a lot of group trips and cooking classes, and and those experiences. Um, you kind of you, you meet other people. You know. Yeah. So I, so I don't know if that's. Trump, you, you know, you're so you're alone, but you don't feel like you're alone. No, that is so. Yeah, I I definitely count that as solo travel, because um, a lot of people think it's weird that I travel alone a lot of the time. And what they don't realize, and I ex- often explain to them, is I may go somewhere alone, but invariably you just meet people. Like a great example is two or three days ago when I was coming back from Shargao to Cebu. I climbed on the, the passenger van to go to the airport and I was seated next to this guy and he immediately he started talking with me and he was an American and we totally hit it off. I wish I'd met him earlier, but we hit it off. We talked nonstop from the van waiting to the airport on the plane and then it ended, it ended up that he was staying at a, a tower next to my hotel. So we ended up hanging out a couple of times in Cebu City and uh, Point being, he was going to introduce me to other people he had met, and he was talking about all the people he had met because he's kind of like a—he's a psychologist of all things. He has a PhD and he has his own psycholog- his own practice, but he just does everything virtually. So he's just been kind of digital nomading and being a psychologist abroad throughout the Philippines for some months now, just working because that's what he likes to do. And um, he's a pretty seasoned traveler. But my point is. When you're by yourself, you'd be surprised at all the people you meet. Like if you've ever read the book, The Celestine Prophecy, or um, what's that book that's famous? Uh, that I think it was Bill Clinton's favorite book, The Alchemist. Like when, and there's a, there's a similar reality where if you go to Spain, I think it's Spain, if you walk this trail, and I forget the name of the trail, it's like a many, many kilometers long trail. All these people, will help you help you out along the way as you need them. And when you're a solo traveler, you'd be surprised of all the people you'll meet and all the friends you'll make because there's so many other solo travelers and pe- people become more authentic and you start you don't have those walls around you that you may have back home. So when you're traveling solo, you actually meet a lot of people in the in a way that you're not really alone and you it's interesting i've said this in other podcasts but on some of my trips in the week or two i'm with people i develop close you know stronger and closer bonds with those people than with people i've known for 20 years in los angeles um so there are there's a beauty to solo travel because there's always an adventure to be had and the people you meet when you're traveling solo it gives you somebody to do these things together with that you wouldn't normally you wouldn't have normally done if you were just by yourself. A case in point, last week, you know, I was just sitting in my hotel in the evenings, staring, you know, watching movies, which I loved. It was like a guilty pleasure. But I, had I met this psychologist guy before, he was out partying every night, and he met this Korean guy, and they got into some hijinks, which I won't repeat here. But um, I'm like, fuck! If I had met those guys, I would have totally gone out with them. So anyway, sorry to distract from what you were saying, Thailandy. Oh no, you're good. But um, but yeah, uh, solo traveling. Um, I think uh, um, something else I learned from another solo traveler was he tends to stay in ho- hostels actually, um, where you meet more travelers. Um, I've kind of defaulted to ho- hotels at this stage of my life, but what do you think about staying in hostels for um, for solo sit travelers? I mean, yeah, I, I think part of it's an age thing. Like for me, I think hostels are probably the the best way to. You're immediately going to have friends. They're almost like, it's almost like being at a fraternity because everybody there is solo and they 
are going to want to talk to you and hang out and everybody's just going to be like, hey, where are we going tonight? So you almost have a built-in family when you arrive. Um, but yeah, similar to a lot of people, I've never, I'd never stayed in a hostel before, especially when I'd hear about people backpacking through Europe, through Europe. For me personally, it wasn't my jam because all I would think about is, wait, I have to share a bathroom with multiple other people or I have to share a room with a whole bunch of people. And like, what if I come home late? What if I want to fart? Like, how does that part work? So I've always stayed in hotels. One of the best experiences I had was in Thailand in Chiang Mai of all places. Hmm. I stayed at this place called the Green Tiger Vegetarian House. I know it's a unique name, but it was a, uh, it was the first, the, well, the first couple levels were, were hostel, dedicated to being a hostel, but then the other levels were just a really nice hotel. And everybody would just congregate in the main restaurant area downstairs. They'd be on their laptops, reading books, eating food. And so that was one of the best experiences I had because I got, you know, like Andy said, we're at the stage in our lives where we would rather a hotel so we can fart in peace. But I got the luxury of being in a nice hotel room with a gorgeous view. But when I'd come down, I was part of that little hostel community. And I made some incredible friends and we went on some incredible adventures like renting motorbikes and met this other dude named Engel. And he was a real nomad. He still is to this day. He's of like no fixed address. And we would just walk for hours around town, just to discussing life and material goods and the lot, you know, why we don't need them. And uh, so there's some, there's really, I'm with you on that. Like hostels are definitely, if you ha if you can stomach them, which they're not that big of a deal, like find a nice hostel for yourself. Cause some of them even have private bathrooms, I think, right? Right, right. It's, it seems like when you look online, there's a lot of different, like hostels is a catch, uh, catch word for, a lot of different types of accommodations. I mean, I think at a minimum, you have a shared bathroom, right? I would assume. Well, that's my general impression of them, but I've seen things that hold themselves out to be hostels where you can pay a little bit more for a private bathroom. But yeah, the general the general theme of what a hostel is is you're in a bit communal room with maybe a couple of bunk beds, right? Is that your understanding? Mm, to, to me... The minimum a hostel is would be, um, would be a shared bathroom. But I think I don't think it's uncommon to have your own room. Oh really? Oh, that's not too bad then. Right. That's not too bad. So and what you could do if you're you know you're a new traveler and you're not sure what to do depending on your budget, do both. You know, book a couple of nights in a hostel and then book a couple of nights in a hotel. You know, see what see what works for you, what doesn't. Another thing I did last time I went to Mualbol is I stayed in a hotel and I just, there was a hostel next to my hotel and I just hung out at the hostel because they don't really care and I ended up meeting people there and you know, it was the same thing. Hey, where's, where are we going tonight? What are we doing? Like everybody just, every, everybody's quite inclusive. I, I think you bring up an interesting and a good point is that, you know, even if you, you have the means to stay in a, ho a hotel and be kind of isolated um you may just want to check out a hostel every once in a while right and switch it up Th that way you you kind of get your fill of both you know like yeah you get that shared experience and then also you kind of get that more luxurious um private experience as well every once in a while i remember hearing the story from somebody um some years ago mm. they were backpacking throughout europe and they ran into this um sorry they ran into this guy at, at their ho at the hostel and he was this big hulking guy i don't remember his name but it turned out he was a famous nfl football player not retired he was just off season and he was actually staying in the hostel you know obviously a multi-millionaire but he had also decided to backpack around europe and was staying in a host in a, just a a hostel with everybody else um because it's quite the experience i'll tell you what i mean of all the people i've heard staying in hostels i've never heard anybody tell me they hate staying in hostels so there's obviously something to them hmm. you know would you, th would you think about staying in a hostel next next time we travel no i would never do that <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> sorry <laughs> Um, yeah, I will if they have HBO. 
free breakfast and uh, room service. So a private bathroom. And definitely a private ba- bathroom. So a hotel. <laughs> with a heated toilet seat. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the gig with you know solo. Now the other type of travel is group travel, and what is that? That's basically where you find a, a travel company that organizes tours before you even leave, and so when you get to wherever you're going, you know they either pick you up from the airport or they all tell you to leave, you know meet at a certain at a certain hotel at a certain time, and you're there with a group of ten to twenty or thirty other people, and there's a fixed itinerary for the next, you know, week or two week, two weeks or three weeks. Now those group tours, you know, some people shy away from them and these people that pretend to be hardcore travelers frown on them. You know, I disagree with anybody tra- frowning on any type of travel. You know, to me that's akin to, you know, I was talking with this girl the other day and she's like, oh, what kind of music do you like? And I was like, oh, uh, you know, I like, I like everything, but one of, right, one of my favorite bands is Coldplay and her response was, Oh, well, they write songs just for radio. As though, you know, somehow their music isn't good because it's commercial. One of them, one of those, right? One of these people, like, right. unless you're eating at a hole-in-the-wall restaurant nobody's heard about, if you eat at, like, McDonald's or Chili's, oh, you're not cool. Even though those restaurants all started off as hole-in-the-walls, <laughs> but they were just good, so they grew. So, you know, if anybody shits on you for thinking of doing a group tour... They clearly have, they've probably never done a group tour or they were just a sourpuss on the group tour because they didn't like losing control. But I've done, pl- I've done plenty of group tours and every single one of them has been outstanding. I've made incredible friends. Um, one of my favorite ones was to Vietnam. I went with Contiki. You know, some of you may be thinking, oh, well, maybe some of these tours are just for elderly people and they're gonna, it's gonna be slow and just museums. You know, those tours do exist, and there are companies just for that. But there are also companies that are for the 18 to 35 demographic, where it's high energy, you're ziplining, you're whitewater rafting, you're going into tiny boats in the Mekong Delta, you're, like, drinking snake blood, and that's a young group. Um, There are groups, there are other group, tour groups that are for ages between that, you know, from 25 to 40 Look at G Adventures. Former, it's a Canadian company. It used to be known as Gap Adventures, but now known as G Adventures. So there, there's travel talk, and they even segment the, they even segment their their tours for like, like, the type of age people go on, whether it's high energy, high adventure. So pick a tour that you know suits your proclivity for adventure. Nothing's wrong with seeing museums. That's part of some of these things. But there are a lot of trips that. They're hiking trips, they're bicycling, there's a trip, there are several trips with G-Adventures where the trip is bicycling around wine country in Italy and going wine tasting and doing all these fun things and staying in like villas. So, you know, find a trip that, that looks cool to you. You know, they're not all the same. They're, they're very specific now. And I, I think they're a fantastic way to see a country because the right tour guides are gonna show you the cool places that if you're on your own, you're not going to see, you know, you can get these hardcore travelers that smell bad and have their dirty backpacks and they think they're a a hardcore traveler and their, their excuse as well. When you're in a group, you don't really get to really know the culture and that's a bunch of bullshit. You can most certainly do walk and chew gum at the same time. You can most certainly be on a group tour and most certainly get to know the culture at the same time, because I've done some group tours where I've done a lot more stuff with with locals and been part of the local scenery than they've ever been um, just being solo because, you know, just because you're by yourself doesn't mean a stranger in Thailand is going to open their door for you to come have dinner with them. So anyways, I'm kind of rambling on. Well, I mean, yeah, like, um, well, I guess I I had a question about group travel, which is, for the, for the introverts out there, like how did how should they think about group travel? If it's something that, if they're worried that you know, they're not gonna have alone time, you know, that introverts need to kind of recharge. Yeah, that's um, a great question, um, and it, it's especially a good question because some people want to go on a trip just to be alone. They want to kind of recharge, and I'm, I'm that guy, right? So I found on my group tours the 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 thing is nobody forces you to do anything. 
I've been on group tours where, you know, you develop, it's just like anything. If you go to cl your first day of class, you're going to know who to cozy up to pretty quickly. Um, so on a group tour, you're going to find your friends and who you're probably going to hang out with the most within the first day. Because you're right away going to hit it off with certain people. But if you're introverted, you know, and you don't, you, you specifically don't want to meet people, people are going to pick up on that. They're going to be super cool with you, but nobody's going to force you to do anything. You're just going to be known as like maybe the, the more shy or quiet person in the group, but not in a negative way. I've, I've, I've had many people in my group where they were kind of wallflowers and they had a great time, you know, just being in a group with nobody bugging them, but still getting the experience and security of being in a group. Uh, but then I've had other people that started off as these silent wallflowers and then halfway through the trip, something opens up in them because they're in this new environment and everybody's being so cool and their guard comes down and they weren't an introvert at all. They, they, they become the craziest drunk you've ever met. So being an introvert on a group is still, it still works, believe it or not, because people aren't going to be pushing you or thinking you're weird because you have such a good panorama of people. And one thing you should know about group tours is it's not like back home. If you're in the States listening to this or Canada, you know, you meet all sorts of jerks and what have you. But when you're traveling in a with a group, usually people are very like-minded as travelers. You, you're not going to meet a lot of closed-minded travelers because they wouldn't be traveling in the first place. They'd probably be living in the Midwest and probably never had left their zip code. So most travelers are very open-minded, very easy to talk to, very non-judgmental. Um, that's why you, people that are like that generally are not going to be in Shargao or like Bangkok. You know, they're not going to... Because they're... Let's put it this way. In all my group tours, I think I've met one single Trump supporter, and he was significantly mentally ill. He was on a Stan's trip. I did a trip of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and everybody was commenting on, how the fuck is this guy a Trump supporter? So my point is you have some normal – the people are very normal. And they're not – and they're also from around the world, too. You should keep that in mind on these group tours. So. Hmm. Yeah. Also, you, you mentioned uh, something about culture and, you know, uh, I think, there, yeah, there is a concern that, that I have about group travel, which is you're so busy doing all the fun stuff that you're not really experiencing what day to day life is. But is that really that important nowadays um, to really know what real life is? Like, do you really want to be because because. Because what I've realized is that even within a in, in a certain country, different people have different lives. So, you know, experiencing the life of a, a restaurant owner is different than the life of a businessman, different than the life of a, than a student, right? It's all part of the culture. So, so really, like, what are you? What are you really getting from not group, from solo travel? You know that that you would that you you would think you're missing out on on group travel. Agreed. Yeah. Like, wh what do you think? What do you think? Like, do do you want to go harvest a field with somebody for a day, and is that what's going to make you feel like you are part of the culture? Like, you could, and you could do that anyway. You could vol. You can most certainly volunteer your time, and also just because you're the group doesn't mean you can't spend more time before your group tour starts or after sticking around doing mm. that solo part. So what I've done on a lot of my trips is I've come in a day or two early, I've done the group tour, and when the tour ends, I actually stick around for four or five more to even a week and just do my own thing now. So I kind of get the best of both worlds. But mm. a lot of the group tours, especially G Adventures, and I sh I'm not trying to plug that company, but they're a pretty good one. What they do is they have a heavy emphasis on, um, you know, learning the culture. So they'll take you to farms, for example. They have agritourism. They call it agritourism, where you'll stay in, on a farm and really learn the lifestyle. And it's, you know, so these tour there are a lot of tours that still are geared towards understanding that. Like when we did... When we were in Kyrgyzstan or when we were in Nepal, like we're up in the Himalayas with at the tea house with the tea house owner and 
he was teaching us about how he operates the place and how he had climbed Mount Everest to the top a couple of times, more than a couple of times. Or, you know, <clears throat> I think it was in Tajikistan, we we're at somebody's house and they made tea for us. So these, these store companies are, are getting a lot, they're moving a lot more to this grass, grassroots level where you will ex experience some of this more hardcore stuff. Not hardcore stuff, but you know, like the local stuff, you know, like without having to, to live in it. You know, because part of the travel, you, we still want to have some of our comforts. If you think you need to feel a bit of pain and sleep on a mat, on a straw floor to feel like you're part of the culture, then go ahead and do that. But, you know, there's more to a culture than that part of the, their day, to, the people's day to day. And like Aunt Ty Landy said, you know, who are you talking about in the culture? The businessman, the investment banker in Thailand, or are you talking about somebody living in poverty? Because it seems like a lot of people think you have to be almost like at the poverty level to really understand the culture. And that's almost a dis, that's almost an insult to the culture and the country in the first place. If you think that's what it's like. Right. Right. <clears throat> so, yeah. So anyways, yeah, that's a good talk. So we had, you know, we covered some ground. So now here we are in Shargao. Um, a lot of water sports here. So Thailand is probably going to, get engaged with some surfing in the next day or two free diving and now he wants I'm more to excited about free diving free diving and then I am going to just try to recover I haven't been feeling that great <coughs> and we'll probably do an island hopping tour and if the rain lets up we're hopefully going to start experiencing some of this really cool nightlife that they have here on the island so Anyways, I thought that would kind of be our podcast for the day. Not super exciting, but, you know, first time we had our guest, Thailandy. Hopefully we'll film, or not film, we'll record some more, more podcasts as the days progress. Maybe make them a little bit more exciting if there's any drinking going on and go from there. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys on the next one.